vendor relations better together. My name is Roger Strong. I'm the Vice President for Global Academic Sales North America at Gale. And I'd like to introduce my colleagues. They can introduce themselves. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm Marianne Ryan, Dean of Libraries at Loyola University, Chicago. Hi, I'm Megan Gaffney. I'm the head of the Collections, Acquisitions, and Resource Sharing Department at the University of Delaware. So just to take you through the next 40 minutes, um, we'll, we're going to start, uh, which we thought we wanted to make it a little bit interactive for you. So we're going to um, start with a Mentimeter survey that we'll ask you to, to fill out as we're um, discussing perspectives up here. And then we'll open that up at the end during the Q&A. And I'll start with the publisher perspective, um, from Gail's perspective, and then uh, Marianne will move into Loyola University Chicago's perspective, and finally Megan will touch on University of Delaware's perspective. So if you have a personal device or a computer and, and you want to take part, um, we'd ask you to log into Mentimeter.com. You'll see the information there, www.mentimeter.com. Enter the code one, two, three, four, six, one, one. And there's just one question. Uh, how would you describe the future of library vendor relations in two or three words from your perspective? And we'll look to share those results out at the end. So before we, uh, before I give perspective on Gail, I thought we'd step in the time machine back to March of 2020 and um, I was at the last in-person library academic conference that I attended, which was the Electronic Resources and Libraries in Austin, uh, Texas, and I'm sure maybe some of you were there as well. And it was sort of a surreal experience. I think we started to hear about um, COVID infection rates and um, spreading across the US and Canada, uh, and, and attention sort of turned to you know, health, safety, what was happening on campus, what do we do? Um, and I think at that point forward, uh, many of us experienced a number of these things that you see up here. I know at Gale, soon after our field sales team travel halted, our inside sales team, which was based in Michigan, moved to remote, uh, working from home, and the Gale Cengage offices closed for what we thought would be uh, an undetermined amount of time, right? We, it was, they were temporarily closed. And then many publishers, including Gail, opened up COVID-19 portals with information for libraries to support information, teaching, research, um, all of those things that uh, they needed to, to support their students on campus and their researchers and, and, and their staff as well. Um, one of the things that came out of that, if it's a you know, a small benefit, if any, is over the next 12 to 18 months, where a lot of very transparent calls with, Zoom calls with libraries about budget, the impact on closing campuses, drop in enrollment, what that meant for them. And I think for us, it gave us good perspective on, you know, what are those, you know, what are those sorts of things we need to look at moving forward to support libraries in whatever that, you know, whenever we came out of this, right? The other thing, um, as we all know, is online conferences became more of a norm for a couple years. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So in preparation for this session, I polled my sales team. I have about 25 um, salespeople across North America back in September to, to get a sense of what, what does the fall 2022 engagement look like with libraries. and. Um, the interesting thing is 82% of customers generally receptive to face-to-face -face customer meetings, which is great. Um, now, I will provide a little bit of a disclaimer that that depends on the region of the country you're in, or if you're in Canada, or certain parts of the world where COVID rates might be higher. Uh, those, those numbers may be a bit different. Um, mixed reasons for declining in-person visits, and I'm sure many of you may have experienced similar things or, or dealing with those things on your campus. Um, not ready to accept visits generally, uh, perhaps just making sure that um, safety and security of students, uh, those sorts of things are happening. Personal preference, you know, maybe maybe it's someone who, you know, health at risk, uh, not necessarily comfortable in that environment yet. 
and some have virtual only as a policy moving forward in, in some situations. So that's something that we ran into too. In terms of face-to-face -face versus virtual meetings, about 60% were primarily Zoom. That was in September. I, I'm happy to, to say that that number shifted to more 50-50 or even more on the majority of being in person versus Zoom. But I think there'll be some sort of happy medium in there as we move forward. And academic in-person conferences becoming increasingly important. We all see that today and this week with the great attendance at Charleston. I think at Gale, we found the online conference experience to be less than rewarding from an ROI perspective. Um, we, you know, we had online um, exhibits, and I think many people were faced with balancing their day job with an online conference, and maybe not necessarily in the moment in that conference. So definitely, we're, we're happy to see conferences back in person. So in September 2021, uh, we created an academic outreach and engagement team that's now, um, it was built and led by um, Sarah Tarpley, who's in the audience, you might have seen her present yesterday, uh, to support our library customers. And we realized post-pandemic with staffing shortages, increased librarian responsibilities, and the need to support more hybrid teaching models, um, this team needed to focus on a few key areas. And some of those areas are dedicated training. So if you think about um, the types of training that we could deliver, whether it's on demand, in person, hybrid model, um, those sorts of things that instruction librarians need to engage faculty and students um, in that new environment. Discovery, I always like to say Gail Switzerland when it comes to discovery services. We don't have a discovery service, but we work with all discovery partners and so our dedicated team of customer success managers advise libraries on ways to support instruction initiatives, learning management system integration, and maximizing use of Gale resources within those discovery systems. And finally, usage and return on investment. So we think about usage and driving usage and partnerships. We've actually expanded a partnership with Springshare to really enhance our LibGuides uh, presence on the web and our team uh, on the academic outreach engagement team works with libraries to integrate Gale resources into those LibGuide pages. This includes subject guides for various disciplines, faculty courses, and one-off guides for key topics. So this is an example of our LibGuide landing page. And um, you can see there are um, a number of different LibGuides that have been created by Sarah's team. I will say the interesting thing that we found in doing A to Z list audits, and, and a good example of this is we actually did an A to Z list audit for an academic library, and we found through that audit that they were missing over or close to 100 primary source collections that they had licensed perpetual access that weren't present on their A to Z list. And so we were able to um, provide them uh, with that information to get those into their A to Z list and, and hopefully drive usage and awareness of those resources moving forward. And this is an example of one of the sort of one-off topics. This is uh, uh, one of our most used LibGuides that we've created. Obviously, when the Russia-Ukraine conflict um, started happening, a lot of research and teaching uh, was going on in this area, and libraries reached out to us for the need to provide more resources for their students in those areas. So um, our team created this LibGuide, and it's today one of our, if not our most used LibGuide that we've created to date. So when we think about um, outside of the, the teaching instruction area, one of the other areas that uh, we've always been, had a big part to play in is digital humanities, but I think we're sort of doubling down in that area. And um, as, as a leading digital humanities publisher with a lot of partnerships, one of those, there are a couple areas that we wanna really focus on. And the Gale Digital Scholar Lab is one of those that uh, back in 2018 when it was released was much more of a data text mining tool. I think we've seen that migrate to become also a tool to be used in data literacy and supporting undergraduate students. And so we've been able to support enhancements to that platform to support libraries and, and drive usage of the archive and Gale primary sources that they have. The other area would be collaborative grant writing. So as libraries seek outside the library funding, We've been successful in partnering with 
libraries around equity, diversity, inclusion content that aligns to strategic missions. So we will uh, support their efforts, uh, look at ways that we can provide aspirational peer analysis for holdings of, let's say, an institution moving to R2 status or other similar areas. And then finally, we've expanded our fellowship partnership program in several ways. Last year, we announced non-residential fellowship programs with both the American Society for 18th Century Studies and the Committee on Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender History. And these are fellowship programs that provide their competitive, um, run through those organizations, and Gale funds five fellowships each that allow a, a stipend as well as access to the Gale S Digital Scholar Lab and our Gale primary source materials in those relevant areas. And I'm pleased to, to let you know we've had quite a bit of success with residential fellowship program in, in partnership with, with Oxford and the Bodleian Libraries um, with our Asia Pacific scholars at Gale. Uh, and we will be looking at opening up an opportunity for a North American fellowship um, in, the, in the coming weeks. And so uh, stay tuned for that, but that's an exciting uh, new development. So as we think about moving forward, and I, you know, it's funny because the, um, the issue brief that Ithaca put out, um, it's not what libraries hold, it's who libraries serve. Um, seeking a user-centered future for academic libraries. This was actually published in January 2020, kind of right before the pandemic hit in the US and North America. But I think in looking at Gwen Evans' quote, um, in terms of the mission of academic and research libraries is expanding and our work is transforming. Collections are alone are no longer sufficient to articulate our new value proposition and establish ROI to our institutions. And as we aim to support the goals of our college and universities and maintain mission relevance, including technological advancement, we must also understand and support the evolving needs and requirements of our users. And I don't think that this quote is too far off in what publishers or vendor partners' missions are either. Um, in many ways, we focus on similar things, uh, whether that's student success, engaging users uh, where they are, and also understanding how we can support faculty research and teaching outcomes and continue to evolve to support these initiatives through tools, technology, and collaborative partnerships. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Marianne. Thanks, Roger. Hi again, everybody. So um, my segment of this is uh, started out as being the Loyola University Library perspective, but I changed it to a Loyola University Dean's perspective, uh, rather than make it sound like I'm representing my institution exactly, because I'm not necessarily sure that they would agree with everything that I'm going to say. But um, I'm going to give you a little bit of context for what Loyola is, because it definitely informs our relationships with our, our vendors, our partners. Um, so we are Chicago's Jesuit Catholic University, and um, for those of you who uh, are or aren't familiar with the Jesuit University community, there are 28 of them in the United States. They are affectionately known as the Great 28, and they are all founded on the same uh, principles of Ignatian values and, and um, social justice primarily. We have three Chicagoland campuses, and then we have centers in Vietnam and Rome, and we have an R2 classification. So we're not a powerhouse institution, um, but you know we're strong and we're credible, and we are fairly decent size right now. We're about 17,000 in enrollment, and there's the breakdown. Um, I came to this position at Loyola from Northwestern, which is just three miles up the road, and people asked me you know, how I would get used to so much smaller a school, and our enrollment is actually pretty much identical to Northwestern's. Institutions are very different. Our signature programs here, you can see our environmental sustainability, public health, social work business, and something called Arupe College. Arupe College is a two-year initiative within Loyola, a kind of community college structure for um, underrepresented, um, underprivileged um, folks who uh, really need a boost for access to higher education. Uh, we were the first institution to launch something like that, and several others have uh, picked up on it and are um, doing similar things. 
Um, our education stresses the importance of, of knowledge, of course, and then curiosity, very strong on global perspectives, inclusivity um, internationally, and, and the value that's called cura personalis, or care for the whole person. And we have a strong commitment to um, DEIA values. I think we had them um, you know, long before um, everyone else kind of came late to the game to some of those things. Now, why is this important? I think it's really important for how we think about our relationships with everybody. And um, we really are looking as we are partnering, whether it's with vendors or anybody else, to have some shared sense of value, of mission, um, of perspective on these things that are important. A little bit about our libraries. Again, we have five facilities on three campuses. We're fairly small, all the more small because we've lost 19 of our original 68 in the last five years. Um, our collections budget took a pretty big hit in the pandemic. We are coming back from it a little, but we are still down considerably. This is our collection size, and as you can see, uh, probably like most of you, we are really increasing in more of the electronic content area. So ebooks, streaming media went through the roof during the pandemic. Um, big emphasis on our digital collections. We just launched an alumni authors collection as well, which we're hoping will become a calling card. So the emphasis on those kinds of collections in and of themselves, but also because of the change that we've experienced in the pandemic have become really important. And they also are something that we're engaging in conversations with um, our donor, our, our vendor partners about. So this changed changing landscape as we're experiencing it, and I, I'm sure you're all experiencing it in your version of the same way. There's this long reach of pandemic disruption, the long tail of it. It's not really going away. Um, you know, we say often the pandemic started for all of us at the same time, but it's kind of not ending at the same time, and the adjustments to it, that long tail of it is playing out differently. We, are, at least, are experiencing reductions in everything. So I talked about budget already. I talked about staffing. Our enrollment numbers are down. That has created an unfortunate staff hiring freeze for us right now when we were hoping to kind of get our, our sea legs back again. Um, our operations are more limited. We used to have services 24-5, I'm sorry. Um, we don't any longer. We have some other restrictions on that as well. And our on-site on presence is down. We have less traffic through our doors. We have fewer staff on site because we're still working in some hybrid modes. The, the less traffic and the reduced operations is really translating to a struggle with um, whether or not we need some of the budget that we had lost because the conveyance is that we don't need all the same things and that includes some of the things that we typically purchase. So we're, we're trying to figure out a way to negotiate that and to convey value when we're continuing to kind of make all of the adju these adjustments to everything. And I think what's additionally challenging is we're figuring it out in real time. You know, in the past when we needed to pivot or adjust, there was sort of a playbook for those things, but right now everything is different. It's, um, it's unfolding in, in this kind of organic but not predictable way. But, but I think the one thing that we really um, have, have come to realize in an undeniable way, I mean, obviously we always knew partnerships were key in libraries, but even more so. Um, internally, faculty support for what we're doing, administrative support for what we're doing. Externally, our consortia, um, partners through our vendors, et cetera. Um, we're finding that there really is a moment right now where strengthening those and defining them in different ways is, is important. So I'm a glass half full person, um, even when it isn't easy to be. And my, my post-pandemic if we're there yet, view is, is really one that there's a lot to be um, excited about and to appreciate right now. So, you know, forced change, which we were all having to do in light of, of the pandemic, is still change, and change is good. And higher ed, characteristically, is not a changing environment, right? I, change comes slowly and painfully, if at all. And we really were kind of turned loose to invent and think about doing things, and that really includes how we engage and relate, I think. We also are at a point where we're you know, rethinking, refreshing, I say, or rebuilding. I feel like we're a sports team in some ways because 
it's like we're just down to the bare bones and we're trying to come back. And really, uh, very early in my career, my first mentor told me that everything can't be the first priority. And I find myself living that now in a whole new and different way. But there also are really great new opportunities right now that there had not been before. And um, those, I think, really manifest in, in what we're seeing, ways that we can engage with vendors that we hadn't before. I think also just resources that weren't there became available in the pandemic, um, state funding, federal funding for various kinds of things that we were able to use. So it's not a completely bleak picture. And I think one of the things that defines the moment also is that we're all in kind of a level playing field of shared experience. You know, we all went through this. You know, in the past, some libraries go through budget cuts, some go through serials cuts, some go through, you know, uh, subscription eliminations, whatnot. Others don't. This time, we pretty much all went through very similar things. And I think that that gives us an ability to engage and to, um, to define and to envision together. And I think that the impact, or maybe a better way to put it, is the possibility of new modalities is really having a, um, a profound um, sort of uh, ability for us to, to change and redo. So I've been as I've been thinking about this, I've been thinking about the evolving reality. In, in, and, and here I want to shift more into how we are, or I am, or I and, and others on my staff and some faculty that I work with have been thinking about this evolving situation. And you know, in the past, we had very strong physical everything. You know, I mean, collections, of course, have been evolving to electronic for some time. But a lot of what we did even, you know, was in a physical space. And, you know, we had a lot of physical content. And the movement from physical context, I think, to a virtual one, in addition to more and more collections and dollars being spent on them going that way, is really undeniable. And I think with that, we're seeing a movement much more from supportive to collaborative along with it. Again, that's not news. I think that's been happening for a while. But I think that, that the difference is that where some relationships, again, internal and external, were more supportive, I think they are evolving more to collaborative. Now I have another animated slide, and I always hold my breath on this one because I'm not sure it's going to work. OK, so here's the evolving. Oh, oh, here goes. Okay, <laughs> here's the evolving model. And I wish I had a, a pointer or something, but um, I, I will say that I think for a long time, you know, we existed, libraries, uh, working with our faculty, you know, vendors working with us, more in this physical supportive area. I think a lot of, um, you know, I mean, I remember our vendor meetings were mostly in person, right? We would wait for the phone call. We would see when they were going to be in town in our territory. We were going to meet that way. It was going to be face to face. And, you know, there was um, a lot of sort of support activity of what they were going to do. And over time, even before the pandemic, but certainly now, it's a much more virtual reality. I think um, we have really yet to meet significantly with anyone in person. We're still meeting virtually. But as Roger said, this is why I think these kinds of situations with conferences will be important. This will, is where we're going to see one another. I don't know that we're going to see one another a whole lot face to face in, in other ways. But there are other opportunities for engagement, and I think that that's a really great thing. So I think you know we're talking here today about how libraries and vendor relationships are better together, and, and they really are. I think about how now they are really beyond what I call the highlighted cat catalog. I don't know if any of you had this experience, but you know, 10 or 15 years ago, vendors would show up at my door, and they would bring a highlighted catalog of everything that we bought from them and a different color of everything we didn't that we should. And so, you know, that did not necessarily show a great understanding of our context. It was more of a sales pitch. I really get a sense now that the understanding is a big piece of the relationship. You know, focus groups have been around for a long time, but I feel like we've moved beyond the focus group. I feel like now there are these active, ongoing conversations that are a, a real give and take of ideas and idea sharing. I really feel we're, we've moved into this kind of complementarity. And I think that it's a really healthy tension. 
there is, you know, the, on the one hand, as I kind of alluded to, universities, not change agents, right? We're conservative, we're conventional. I mean, we're institutions, literally. You know, but vendors are agile, right? I mean, they take risks, they, you know, force change, they really kind of, um, I think, challenge us in some ways that are very healthy and very good. And I think that we have moved into a place where we really share commitments in different ways and our visions align in better ways. You know, I don't want to use a phrase like, you know, the almighty dollar, right? <laughs> but back when, you know, you would hear people talk about, you know, al al it's always about the sale. I, I just, I don't have that sense any longer. I really see this um, similar commitment to values, to things like student success, to engagement, um, you know, to DEI, um, helping to contribute to product development, et cetera. I talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So here are some of the expanding partnership opportunities that we've been engaging in and that I think are really great opportunities that our vendor colleagues are providing us with. One is contributing to product development and improvement. Um, for us, the Digital Scholar Lab of Gale is, is one of those really huge things. We're uh, a, a tremendous user of it, and one of our faculty who uses it very heavily is involved in um, fueling that conversation and that pipeline. Um, most vendors have advisory boards that we participate on very actively. I know that many of you do these same things. There are engagement programs. I know Gail has a user engagement program, and that same faculty member that I mentioned just a, a while ago is a participant in it. Um, there are sponsorship opportunities. Um, we have, or had before COVID, we will be reinstating um, something that we call a, a technology showcase every year, and vendors come to that. We're gonna be expanding it and their role in that as well. Uh, competitions, essay contests, video contests, um, been getting tremendous vendor support for that. Um, awards, we've seen awards at conferences that um, vendors have been supporting for a while, and some of those have been pivoting into new areas. And then professional meetings and conference presentations, witness this one. But professional meetings even, I mean, Charleston's such a great example of that because it was founded on that premise of better together, of vendors and libraries working together. And then finally, research and scholarship. I think, you know, between things like the fellowships that Gail are offering and, and we and vendors collaborating together to conduct research and, and contribute to new knowledge of our own, um, I think is another really great direction. So that is it. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over to Megan. Thank you, Marianne. I was getting the five minute signal from our moderator here, so I may speed through this a little bit more quickly than I had anticipated, but um, thank you, everyone. Um, I'll close our panel today by talking about the University of Delaware and sharing a quick case study of a project that we really heavily relied on our vendor colleagues to carry out. Um, reminder, just very, very quickly, we do have a Mentimeter poll, mentimeter.com, code 1234611. Tell us your keywords, please. Uh, we'll show at the end what you all contributed. I'll skip over this slide because the context is something you can all Google if you're interested, but that's the University of Delaware's campus in Newark, Delaware. Um, the library's on the left-hand side, if any, or the main library, if anybody is ever curious about what that looks like. Um, I introduced myself as the head of collections acquisitions and resource sharing, but I've spent the last 15 years being a resource sharing librarian. ILL has been my passion for a very long time. Um, so when we talked about the theme of better together for our discussion today, I thought about the work I've done with vendors for the last 15 years, um, particularly during the pandemic when so much was changing. And I wanted to highlight a few um, projects like Rapid ILL and the Received Now Hermes project. If you're not familiar with any of these resources because you're not a resource sharing geek like I am, I encourage you <laughs> to, to Google them because um, they provided opportunities for libraries to work together and share research during a really difficult time um, during COVID closures. And generally speaking, resource sharing librarians have a very good relationship with our vendors in making sure that our platforms are working the way they need to be and just kind of extending the collaboration between institutions to 
um, working with the people who are helping to support our technology and services. Um, at the University of Delaware, much like all of you, we had um, the impact of the pandemic coming through in the same ways that you did. Um, operations were virtual for many, many months, and we were relying on those strong resource sharing partnerships to make sure our users had what they needed. We experienced a reduction in our budget for staff, operations, and collections. That collections reduction meant some very painful cancellations for continuing resources, and we're still not considering new subscriptions. And I tried to scroll down in the speaker notes and went to the next slide. Um, for over a year, we had a freeze on monograph purchases because we did not have the resources to be providing them to our users unless they were essential for research or teaching. I'm sure this is not new to many of you who have been working in libraries through this difficult time. Our current status is that we're back to our buildings, but hybrid work arrangements are available for staff when they can carry out their job responsibilities remotely. Um, some staff are in site for their entire work day. And we are among the institutions that Roger mentioned. We are welcoming vendors back to our library, but we're being very honest with them about our current budget situation. Um, we're not able to commit to new continuing resources because of that budget cut that we experienced. It still hasn't been restored. So we want to see our vendor colleagues because we have a lot of positive long-term relationships with them. Um, again, I mentioned a few slides ago, I keep saying we, we experienced a significant cut to our collections budget and we communicated that impact widely to the campus community. Um, the image here is a screenshot of our webpage with messages from our vice provost and director of libraries. We had to make some very difficult decisions as I'm sure many of you did too. And moving forward, we need to make sure once again, I'm having technological difficulties, that we are making um, the best decisions we can with the limited funding that we have. So I'd like to share a specific example of library vendor cooperation in action. Um, the University of Delaware, I think, may be sort of unique in this way. Maybe not, you all can let me know, but we're fortunate to have opportunities to apply for funding from a charitable foundation called the Unidel Foundation, which specifically promotes higher education in Delaware by providing targeted grants to the University of Delaware. So in 2021, we applied for a grant for one-time funds to acquire a curated collection to determine how the past informs the present and better understand the conditions that have led to the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, grant funding provided us with an opportunity to contribute to a very important pillar of the university's strategic plan to support the important work of the university's anti-racism initiative and other campus groups. And very importantly, it helps us to balance our collection goals and our campus needs with a reduced or flat budget. On the left side of the slide, you'll see a selection of materials that were purchased when our grant application was successful last year. We worked very carefully with our vendor partners to learn more about collections that would support our goal. And we invited one of our suppliers to curate a specific list of about 100 films that we could add to our streaming media collection to strengthen materials related to African American history and contemporary events. We don't yet know whether our 2022 proposal was successful, but we worked again with our vendor colleagues to curate a specific list of collections and resources that would support the growing interest on our campus in gender and sexuality studies. So circling back to the theme of Better Together, I'll emphasize that our grant proposal was really strengthened by the willingness of our vendors to provide broad collections and curated lists of titles that are really relevant to our themes. We learned we were very clear with our timeline and our goals. We um, would love to acquire content that supports campus initiatives, but unless we are successful in our grant proposal, our reduced collections budget won't allow us to do so. These conversations with our vendor partners helped us to be very precise in our grant applications to discuss what precisely we wanted to acquire. And of course, our vendor colleagues are very pleased when the grant is um, given to us and they're able to make that sale. In the future, I see this model being very common. Libraries are constantly working to keep up with new research areas and may not have increased collections funding to acquire what we need. One way to maximize our funds is to have these proactive conversations with vendors to stay current on what's available and to take the time to learn about their special collections, perhaps even getting curated titles of lists from our partners. Libraries need to, again, getting back to the model of resource sharing that I was praising earlier, 
also be open with our vendors about how their discovery indexing and, and um, their platforms in general are working for our users so that we can work together to continue to have a good experience for our end users who are increasingly relying on online resources. Um, with that, I know I went a little bit over, but I will turn it to Roger and he will share the results of the Mentimeter survey. Thank you. I think we, we have about five minutes left or so. Um, so as we share these results, we uh, ask that um, if anyone uh, wants to make a comment on their own experience around library vendor relations, we'd welcome that or have any questions for for us. But uh, this is what you all um, entered. And we see a lot of, uh, lot of partnership, collaborative, transparent, um, stressing, which I don't disagree. There's that, that can be a part of it too. Um, so it's and, and we'll be sure to uh, um, to include these on the the, the post uh, you know the post session here in Charleston for folks to look at. But this is uh, yeah. So this this is what everyone here included, and I think there's a lot of elements here that um, that I'm sure we all can relate to. So I don't know if anyone wanted to comment based on what they inputted why they maybe had a particular word or two that described their their th their thought about the future of library vendor relations. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Oh, there you go. <laughs> you are on mute. Hi, James English, lyricist. Uh, had a question if any of y'all in some of your collaboration and experience with vendors had to actually deal with multiple vendors at the same time for a particular project in which two separate commercial entities working together with the library and they had to work together as well. If y'all had that experience or could speak to that. Um, I can say that I've had that experience. Um, it is sometimes interesting, um, you know, the, um, without being too specific, um, one of those is not necessarily working together, but it's working toward a similar solution, product solution, um, that gave way to a three-way conversation. Um, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, the other, uh, I would say, is our, our technology showcase that I mentioned before, where we're really bringing in a lot of people to um, help with training demonstrations and, and the like, and um, that's always been a very positive experience, although there, there is um, sometimes a vested interest that we have to try to work around and, and focus on um, kind of more the training and less the commercial piece. As, as one of my colleagues said to me at one point, there, there is the difference between a .edu and a .com, and, and we, we sort of have to allow both of those things, but then work around and with them. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference, thanks.